Okay, so in today's video, we're going to be looking at sequences of functions. Sequences of functions. So in the previous video, we proved something called the nested interval theorem, which stated that if you have a sequence of nested closed intervals, um, so such that I, I0 is the big interval and everything else is a subset, so I1 is a subset of I0, and I2 is a subset of I1, etc., then we prove that the intersection of all these uh, all these intervals is is not the empty set. So there is some stuff inside this inside this intersection. Okay. Uh, now we're going to be talking about sequences of functions. Specifically we're going to be talking about sequences of continuous functions. So Recall that uh, by the definition of, of uh, continuity of a function, um, a function f of x, let's say from the closed interval a, b uh, to the real numbers, so it maps the closed interval a, b to the real numbers, let's say it's continuous on some point, um, let's say c in a, b. So what that means is that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f at c, that point. And a function is continuous over an entire interval if it's continuous at every single point in the interval. Now, knowing this, there's something interesting we can say about uh, sequences of functions. And, well, I guess we'll write the theorem. So, if a function, if a function um, f from the closed interval a, b maps to r um, is continuous is continuous on a, b then for any sequence x, n um, that converges converges to um, some C in a B the sequence F of X and also converges but it converges to F at C uh, a few things we have to just talk about before proving this theorem um, I didn't explicitly say that x sub n has to always be an ab, but for this to actually make any sense, uh, for the first few terms of, of this sequence here to be defined, uh, that needs to be the case. So for instance, if f of x1 is not an ab, then this has no meaning. We don't know if f um, even has value at this point x1. So we're just going to be assuming that x sub n is also um, always an ab, okay? It's bounded in ab. Okay, so the proof then is as follows. Remember that we say that the limit as x approaches uh, c of f of x is equal to L. Well, what that means is uh, for all positive numbers greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that if you consider any point x, which is a distance less than delta away from c, then at that point x, the distance between f of x and L will be less than epsilon. And this can be done for every, for all, or for every positive number epsilon greater than zero. You can always find a delta such that as long as you have points which are a distance less than delta away from c, then the distance between f at those points and L will always be less than epsilon. Okay? That's what it means for um, something to have a limit as x approaches c. Okay. Now, we know that uh, x sub n converges to c. So what that means is that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists this time not a delta, but this time a natural number um, n, a natural number n, such that if the index of the sequence, little n, is larger than n. So as long as we take 
terms after after x sub big n. So after this, so like x sub big n plus 1, for instance, x sub big n plus 2. Then the distance between those terms, so the distance between those terms, then the distance between those terms and um, whatever x converges to, uh, sorry, x sub n converges to, which in this case we said is c, can be made less than epsilon. Okay? Now, we know that f is continuous on a, b. Okay, f is continuous on a, b. So that means f is also continuous at this point c, which means that um, suppose we want f of x to be less than epsilon away from c, and all we need is, uh, you know, there exists some delta 1 such that if the distance between x and c is less than delta 1, then the distance between f at x and um, f at c can be made less than epsilon. Now, uh, if we claim, if, if f of xn, which is a sequence, uh, truly converges to f of c, we should be able to find a natural number in n such that as long as we take terms after the f of x big nth term, the distance between those terms and f of c should be, be able to made, should be uh, less than epsilon, or at least we should be able to, we should be able to make it less than epsilon, sorry. Okay, so what is this natural number and how do we, how do we find it to show that f of x sub n truly converges to f of c? Um, so it's not, it's not that difficult. Notice that as long as the distance between x and c is less than delta sub 1, then the distance between f of x and f of c can be made less than epsilon. So all we need to do is take a natural number, let's call it m, such that for all n greater than m, the distance between x sub n and c is less than delta 1. And that's got to exist because x sub n converges to c. Remember, the definition of a sequence converging is this over here. And epsilon could be anything. We just set epsilon equal to delta 1. And so once that's done, we know, because f is continuous, and that this is true, we know that since f is continuous and x sub n is just some point that's a distance less than delta 1 away from c, that f at that point, the distance between f at that point and f of c have also, has also got to be less than epsilon. So that's it. That, that's the proof that um, if a function f is continuous on a closed interval a, b, and we have a sequence in that interval that converges to a point, um, also, also in that interval, well, well it has to, if, if the sequence is bounded in that interval, it has to converge to a point in that interval, then f of x sub n also has to converge to f at c, where that, where c is where the sequence converges. Okay, so this is quite an important theorem. And also, because earlier I, I, I mentioned how if you have a sequence, um, that's always, you know, in this closed interval AB, and it has a limit, and it has a limit, that that limit has also got to be, uh, in AB. And the reason is, is not very difficult. It's, um, well, quite simply, suppose, suppose that L was greater than B. Okay, suppose L was greater than B. Now, there exists a natural number N such that if you take N greater than big N, the distance between X sub N and L can be made, made smaller than any positive natural number. So why not we just, why don't we just take L minus B? Well, then that implies that X sub N minus L is less than L minus B is greater than B minus L, which implies that x sub n is actually larger than B. So x sub n can't be in this closed interval. So we have a contradiction because that was one of our assumptions. And similarly, if you claim that the limit is uh, less than A, then what will follow is that, well, x sub n has to be less than A for all n uh, greater than some n. And so again, you'll reach another contradiction. So that shouldn't be uh, too hard to uh, see that if, if you have a sequence that's always bounded in a closed interval, its limit, if it has one, also has to be in that interval. Okay. Uh, I think we'll cover one last thing.
and that's the boundedness. Oh, no, not the boundedness, sorry. That's something called uh, Balzano, hope I'm saying it right, Weierstrass, uh, which basically says if you have a sequence xn that is always bounded in AB, then there exists, there exists a subsequence, uh, I guess we can call it x n star that converges. Okay, um, I'll see if I have time to prove this entire theorem. Um, if not, then I'll put the rest of the proof in the second part of this video. Okay, so how do we prove it? Well, let's take an interval a, b. Let's take an interval a, b. Um, it might, whoops, it might look something like that. And we have a sequence inside the interval, so x1, uh, x2. We don't know if the sequence converges or not, okay? We don't know if it converges or not. Um, but obviously we assume it has infinitely many terms, because if it didn't, then, well, it would converge. So let, let's, let's, let's subdivide um, this interval. So this interval over here, this interval over here are two intervals. Now, one of these intervals has to contain infinitely many points, because if both contained finitely many points, then our whole sequence would converge. So let's say this interval over here contained infinitely many points. Keep drawing them, keep drawing them, keep drawing them. Well, let's subdivide this interval again then. And by the same argument, one of these intervals, I should use a different color, one of these intervals over here must contain infinitely many points. And when we keep doing that, right, when we keep doing that, we realize we have a sequence of nested intervals. We're creating a sequence of nested intervals. Remember last video we proved that a sequence of nested intervals uh, that are all non-empty, and clearly all of these are non-empty, has to have a non-empty intersection. So there's got to be some element, right, as we keep subdividing, that is always in one of these nested intervals. So what that means is as long as we choose a subsequence, um, sort of like, well, in a sense that we choose, we define x1 to always be part of the first interval, x2 to be part of the second interval, x3 to be part of the third interval, we can choose any x that's part of the interval, and we create a sequence, then the distance between a, the point, right, which is, which has got to exist by the Ness's interval theorem, the point that is in all the intervals, and the terms of our sequence, which are which also have to be in those intervals, is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller for the simple reason that we're halving the size of the interval. So if we're halving the size of the interval, the max distance between one of our one one of the terms of our sequence and this point that lies in the intersection of all the nested intervals can only be so big. Specifically, it can only be um, you know as big as b minus a over two to the power k for um, the, the kth nested interval. Okay, so clearly this tends to zero, and therefore our sequence can be made as close as we like to this point that belongs to the intersection of every single nested interval. And so this really, this is just a general outline of the proof. Um, uh, either I will write it up formally in the next video, or if not, then I'll write it up formally on my blog and I'll put a link to that in uh, the description. Alright, so that's that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.